Hello everyone. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you're joining us from. My name is Ruchika Sikri and I work at Google. Uh, for the last 15 years, I have uh, had the true honor and privilege to be working here. Uh, today, I am delighted to welcome Nate Klemp and Kaylee Klemp to discuss their book, The 8080 Marriage. Not the 50-50, folks, the 8080 marriage, a new model for a happier, stronger relationship. Nate and Kel Kaylee developed the idea of the 8080 marriage, uh, a new model for balancing career, family, and love. The model pushes couples beyond the limited idea of fairness towards a new model grounded on radical generosity and shared success one that calls for each partner to contribute 80% to build the strongest possible relationship. So a quick introduction for each of them, and then we will roll into some questions. Uh, Nate Clamp, he's a PhD and is a former philosophy professor and a cool founding partner at Mindful. He is co-author of Start Here, a New York Times best-selling guide to mindfulness in the real world. Uh, Nate received his BA and MA from uh, Stanford University and his PhD from Princeton University. Kaylee Clamp, uh, his beloved wife, Nate's beloved wife, is a highly sought after executive coach specializing in building trusting and synergistic teams. We don't, we don't we all need that in our lives? Yeah. She is also an Enneagram expert, certified young president's organization facilitator, TEDx speaker, and co-author of the 15 Commitments of Conscious Leadership. She received both her BA and MA from Stanford University as well. So I won't be surprised that's where probably Kaylee and Nate met, uh, but let's find out more from them. Welcome, Kaylee and Nate. Warm, warm welcome. Hi, Ruchika. Thank you so much for having us. Thanks so much. It's so great to be here. Yeah, it's such, such a delight and such a um, important topic as we're navigating, you know, our lives amidst these uncertain, new, ambiguous circumstances. So, so let me start with this question, which is related to the times today we're living in. Hmm. Many of us are now at home all the time. <laughs> all of us, all the time. <laughs> it seems like many couples are compromising their connection together. What, to, what tips do you have for me, for all of the couples uh, and the partners who are listening to us today? It's such a great question, Ruchika, because really what we found is that while these times are crazy, and as you're describing it, we're spending so much more time close and in the same quarters, but interestingly, sometimes not connected. And what we found is that it's actually amplified some of the things that modern couples had been facing all along. So this question of always on, right? The news cycles 24 seven, our economy is global. There's sort of a, the world never sleeps experience. Our work follows us home in our pockets before we were at home all the time, where now all those spaces are starting to collapse. So once upon a time where I went to work or our daughter went to school, and now they're all happening in this really compact space. And what we're noticing is that couples now, even more than ever, are recognizing that our context of someone always needs something from us can really have us accidentally put this precious relationship of marriage off to the side. That couples will tell us, you know, we're sitting on the couch together, but we're texting each other our Costco list instead of actually having a conversation. And so one, we really need this mindset shift back to radical generosity. Two, we need a much more clear structure where it feels like we win together in shared success. And then just a quick tip, we also need some space some physical space where we are separate from one another, even if that's just to walk around the block, because it's funny, distance makes the heart grow fonder and just a little bit of distance can sometimes give us more incentive to be close and connected. Well, I would just add, Kaylee was talking about physical space, which is really key. But the other thing that's super important, especially in these times where we're sort of crammed in together is what we think of as mental space or headspace. 
And this really connects to something that I know is a big deal in the Google culture, which is this whole idea of cultivating mindfulness. Yeah. You know, and part of that is being intentional about the kinds of distractions that we have, both during work and outside of work, right? Uh, social media, text, email, all that sort of thing to just give ourselves a break from that every once in a while. But then there's also the more intentional cultivation of mindfulness and focused attention through either formal practice or informal practice. And one of the things I'm really excited about for today is, you know, most of the time we think of mindfulness as this kind of individual quality, you know, as a individual person, I'm noticing when my attention is wandering and I'm bringing it back. But we also think mindfulness can have this relational aspect to it that, you know, this distraction not only takes us away from our experience of the present moment, but it takes us away from connecting. Yeah. So that's something that I think is an opportunity in these cramped spaces and in strange times, but also something we'll hopefully talk more about. For sure. You know, Kaylee, what you said about just texting each other Costco list and grocery list, you know, that is what I'm seeing happen mostly. Like, you know, when we would go to office, we would just even check in on each other, you know, on the way home or something. But you're right. Right now, it's like everything is so bound into the chores uh, and the list of things. Um Nate, you know, can you talk a little bit? I love, like, you know, you know that I'm a big fan of mindfulness and have been practicing this yes. personally for 20 years. Uh, really curious, like, do you have a tip or two that the couples or the partners uh, can bring in into their life around mindfulness? You know, the notion yeah. of mindfulness right now is like you just sit on a cushion and meditate. Yes. Uh, but how do you bring it into relationship, into these tricky yeah. situations? And yeah. Can you Absolutely. talk to us a bit about that? Yeah, well, so one of the things we're going to talk a lot about, I think, is this default state that many of us fall into, which involves a whole lot of scorekeeping and trying to make things fair and measuring what I do against what Kaylee does. And as we'll talk about, it's a recipe for all sorts of conflict and tension. But what's really interesting about that state is it's really a mindset. And it's a conditioned mindset by our culture and some of the patterns we fall into. But what we found is that when that happens, when you fall into that sort of comparing mind, where it's, you know, what did I do versus what did Kaylee do? There's a pretty simple solution to it. And it's really just a mindfulness-based technology, which is to notice, you know, becoming aware. That's, as Sharon Salzberg says, that's the magic moment of mindfulness. Without awareness, there is no choice. We just follow the stream of habit. But if we can become aware that we're doing this, then all we have to do sometimes is just a simple mental shift, a note in our mind like radical generosity or ADHD. And we'll get into more about what that means. But sometimes that simple shift can just change the spirit of our relationship, can change my dynamic between the two of us from one of comparing to one of giving and contributing and, and being generous. So I would say, you know, in all of mindfulness practice, the key is that noticing then some sort of a shift, whether that's to the present moment or to connection with your spouse or to radical generosity, and then just the ability to sustain that shift, you know, and, and anytime the mind wanders, come back. Mm -hmm. So what I'm hearing is like, you know, that foundation of mindfulness and presence that can generate some kind of just a connection as a human being can lead us into the generosity. I'm really curious down the line to listen, to hear more from you uh, on that. In fact, Kim, uh, Kim La has posted a question mm -hmm. and she's asking, do you have any tips around radical generosity and how we can make that? Oh, yeah. Yes, for sure. Yes, we do. Well, let's see. Before we get to radical generosity, does it make sense to sort of set that up with the antithesis of radical generosity or what we call 50-50 fairness? Does that? Yeah. Yeah. Let's explore that. You know, I know one okay. of the questions I wanted to explore with you is that what what is one of the key idea you explore in your book is the 50-50 fairness. How does this show up and why is that a problem? So maybe you can talk to us about that first and then we can take Kim's question about radical generosity. Perfect, yeah, let's do that. 
Okay. But yeah, this this idea of 50-50 fairness, we find fascinating. Um, this was the idea we fell into early on in our marriage because we were both uh, professionals. We were both striving to achieve our own personal goals and ambitions. And as a result, when faced with this question, how do you be equals? How can you be equals and in love and marriage? Our answer was to say, well, let's just try to make everything perfectly fair. And we thought if we could just find this perfection of 50 50 fairness, we'd live in this state of marital bliss and never fight, and it would just be amazing. Now, that turned out to be a total disaster for us. It almost ended our marriage, to be quite frank. <laughs> um, because it led to all sorts of conflict and, and resentment. And then, you know, for this book, we interviewed about 100 people because we really wanted to make this book about the broader experience of modern marriage. And we found that just about every couple had their own version of this fairness fight, this conflict. So, for example, there was one couple, we talked to them and they were trying to figure out how do we divide Mother's Day and Father's Day, because we want to visit both sets of parents. And they came up with what seemed like this perfect 50-50 bargain, where they said, okay, for the husband's family, we're going to go visit them on Father's Day, and for the wife's family, we'll go on Mother's Day. And it seemed thing. totally fair, right? But then when it came to the exact timing of when they were going to go, the husband said, well, yeah, for my family, let's leave on Friday, come home on Sunday. And for yours, how about we leave Saturday and come home on Sunday? So we were interviewing the wife as well. And she was like, I was just so outraged. Yeah, just this is crazy. And at the same time, she said, I actually kind of wanted to leave on Saturday to visit my family as well. Um, so this is just like one example of so many. And the reason, though, we think fairness is an important starting point for this conversation is that underneath these conflicts, there's something really key that we started to understand when we looked at the literature and psychology and the research and family studies. And that is that this whole idea of fairness, it's kind of like a mirage in the desert. You think it's there. You think if you just go further toward it, if you get closer to it, you'll finally reach it. But the reality is it just sort of recedes into the background the closer you get to it. And there are two reasons for this that we found just totally fascinating. So the first is what cognitive psychologists call availability bias, which is basically just a fancy way of saying that everything I do, all of my contributions to our marriage, all my trips, you know, taking our kid to school or dragging the trash cans out to the curb, that's all available to me. I have a perfect insight into that data set. But when it comes to what Kaylee does, I don't know, things get like a little bit blurry. Right, like I am intimately familiar with every basket of laundry folded, every dishwasher emptied, but how long did it take to help with the spelling bee? Exactly. So we tend as a result to systematically underestimate the contributions of our spouse. But then it gets even worse because psychologists have also observed that we systematically overestimate our own contributions. So in other words, when I tell Kaylee I, I was cleaning the kitchen for 90 minutes, it was probably more like 60. This is just a, a natural cognitive bias that all of us fall into. So as a result, we're overestimating what we do, we're underestimating what our partner does, and then we get into all these fights over what is or isn't fair, using essentially delusion and really bad data. And it's no wonder that this becomes this kind of constant conflict that we can never resolve. And I think the last thing I would just say is the real problem with all of this is that it distracts us from what we really want out of marriage and relationships, which is to be connected and to be in love, right? So, so this is why I think fairness is an important starting point just to mm -hmm. see why that doesn't work. It's funny. Every time he talks about overestimation bias, it makes me think of Calvin and Hobbes. And Calvin is measuring his push-ups based on how they feel. So he counts his push-ups, some version of like one, two, 20, a hundred, because that's how housework and childcare very often feels. Yeah, it feels exhausting. It does, and so it makes sense that we sort of count in this delusional way. So if we start with 50-50, right, we're getting to this question of radical generosity that you were asking about. We make the transition now to 80-80. And backing up for a second, what are all these numbers? What are we actually even measuring? 
we're measuring the spirit of contribution to the relationship. So with 50-50, the spirit of contribution is fairness. I want to only do my part. No more, no less, but I am measuring and I'm keeping score and I am tallying in the background. Whereas with 80-80, the spirit of contribution is that of radical generosity, that I am striving to do more than just my 50% that I'm striving to contribute at 80%. Now, for all the math folks in the room, we recognize that there's actually no such thing as a 160% possibility, but that it's not mathematically possible is kind of the point, that we want to blow up love beyond the necessity of perfectly equal math. So now that we've stretched to 80-80 in terms of our spirit of contribution, there's two pieces. The mindset piece, which is radical generosity, they'll unpack some more in just a second. And then there's also the structure piece. And it's important to have both. Mindset is necessary, but in some ways insufficient because we have to be able to put that mindset into practice in the world. So the mindset of radical generosity then facilitates a structure of shared success. And that's really shifting from our individual projects, our individual pursuits to say, what does it look like for us to win together? So radical generosity, want to unpack it? Yeah, sure. So I realize we're we're taking a, a long-winded route here, but we're sort of laying out a lot of the big conceptual pieces, which I think should hopefully be helpful. So this idea of radical generosity, as Kaylee was saying, is really the key shift in mindset that takes us from this 50-50 model to this alternative of 80-80 marriage that we're putting forth in the book. And again, I think it's really important to view this against the backdrop of our cultural tendency to fall into this 50-50 habit. And as a result of this habit, doing something generous for your spouse when you're constantly keeping score and there's resentment and all these things going on, Doing something generous sounds crazy, right? Because it's not fair. By definition, doing something radically generous is basically exiting the whole game of fairness. So given just the sort of insanity or the craziness of this move, we decided to call it radical generosity because we think it is in some ways pretty extreme. It's, it's counter habitual, it's counter cultural, and it's just something that takes in some ways a leap of faith to try, but we think it's worth it because there are all sorts of benefits that flow from it. But then in terms of the question, which was about like, what do you do and how does this look in real life? In the book, what we've tried to do is break radical generosity down into three primary elements. So the first element is what we think of as contribution or what we do in marriage. And you can think of this as not necessarily those huge over-the-top contributions. It doesn't have to be planning a trip to Bali with your spouse, not that you can do that now anyway, but it could be making your partner a cup of coffee. It could be leaving them a post-it note on their nightstand. It could be doing a chore for them. These are just simple acts of generosity that can really change the underlying spirit of marriage. And it was really cool, actually, just right before we hopped on this call, we got an email from Brad Feld, who is an entrepreneur and a venture capitalist here in Boulder. And he was telling us that his wife, Amy, is a big knitter. And so sort of inspired by the book, he went and untangled this ball of yarn that had been <laughs> vexing Amy. And I, I will, we just love this example where it's so generous, so thoughtful, and so tailored to how Amy received that gift. Yeah, it wasn't. Fair. I mean, it no. was that was her ball of yarn. Right. She should have been the one doing it, right? <laughs> yeah. So, so that's the first piece. The second piece of radical generosity is really about what we see in relationship, or we think of this as appreciation. So the basic idea here is that most of us, when we're operating in this kind of 50-50 mindset, we have this sort of bad habit of scanning our partner's actions throughout the day to see everything they did wrong all the ways they drop the ball. And then when we see that, we usually let them know through some sort of criticism or passive aggressiveness. Like how does how does a man as brilliant as you, like how is he unable to load a dishwasher? That's how true, that? guilty. <laughs> 
But the alternative here, the shift to appreciation is really changing the way we see our partners. So instead of scanning their behavior for everything they did wrong, we're looking now for the things they did right or the ways they contributed. And then when we see that, just giving them a simple thank you. The final piece of radical generosity, and I realize this is the super long-winded answer, but hopefully it'll lay out the elements of the concept. The final piece is really about um, what we say. We think of this as revealing. So this may sound strange, but we think this is really important because if you just think about contribution and appreciation, it starts to sound like this is some sort of weird marital utopia where you just like do all these amazing things and your partner says thank you and you ride off into the sunset and live happily ever after. And we found that's certainly not our experience, not the experience of anybody we interviewed, that no matter how well couples were doing, they just have these inevitable moments where the whole thing breaks down and somebody gets pissed off, somebody's feelings get hurt, somebody feels resentful. And so this final step of revealing is noticing, so this is where the mindfulness comes in, noticing those moments. And instead of reverting to criticism or complaint or passive aggressiveness, just offering your partner an authentic reveal of your emotional experience, and then perhaps some sort of request. So for example, if I've been cooking dinner for half an hour and I told Kaylee, come on up, it's time for dinner, and it's been 10 minutes and she's still in her office, I might feel really frustrated and upset. And and the way to reveal that might be as simple as just saying, hey, you know, I made this dinner. It really kind of hurts my feelings when, you know, I call for you and, and you don't come up. Can you please just let me know that you're not coming up for 10 minutes next time? Or can you come up when it's time for dinner? So all of that's very long winded, but that's kind of the the idea behind radical generosity that shows up in these various ways. Wonderful. Well, you laid it out so well with the connection of the 50-50 to going to 80-80 and then the three steps to this radical generosity. Do you mind like, just summarizing those three steps once again for you? Because there were so many details I want the listeners to walk away with. Well, here are the three things and yeah. myself to walk away with that too. Absolutely. And Virginia, let's even take it a step further. So let's take it out of concept and okay. let's put it into practice. So mm-hmm. part one of radical generosity is about contribution. So for everyone who is joining us, grab a sheet of paper or wherever you make notes to yourself and think of one radically generous act of contribution that you can do for your partner and capture it somewhere so that you remember as soon as we finish so that you can actually go do that for your partner. Now, again, this isn't necessarily, you know, an hour long massage, although I would sign up for one of those. Why not? Right? This good. is turning on the coffee maker. This is helping untangle the yarn. This is leaving a sticky note on their computer that says, I love you. Just one radically generous act of contribution you could do for your partner. And once you've got that written down, we're going to do the second piece of radical generosity, which is appreciation. And so perhaps on a sticky note, perhaps if your phone is nearby and you can text someone without completely losing your attention, invite you now to express an appreciation for your partner. If you happen to be with your partner right now, joining us in this experience, you could turn to them and say it. If you're you know, not with them at this moment, you could text them an appreciation. Again, these can be small things, things like, I appreciate your creativity in the cocktail you made last night. Or it could be, I appreciate the patience with which you are helping our child log on to school this morning. That they can be some of the small things that might get overlooked but to call them out with that sentiment of gratitude, with appreciation. And one example of this is a real appreciation. So Kaylee, I appreciate you. Last week, our child was in this spelling bee that had to be held outside because they couldn't do it indoors. And it was snowing and it was really cold. And I appreciate you, Kaylee, for making sure she had a warm jacket. She got all the clothes she needed so that she could be out there braving the elements. Thank you. 
And so you get the idea. Contribution and appreciation are things that can happen every day. These are things that can be turned into habits. With reveal and request, that last piece of radical generosity, those are often more situational. If you have something that's tickling your brain, you can make a note of that. And this is where, Rashika, I think it comes back so beautifully to what you were describing around mindfulness. Can you bring a spirit of mindfulness, of radical generosity, to the tone and the quality with which you make that request of your partner and as you reveal your sentiment. And if you do those three pieces, contribute, appreciate, reveal and request, you find that sort of virtuous cycle in your relationship and your connection. Beautiful. As I was listening to you, I was like, oh my gosh, I have a list of things that I could be doing, you know, despite like practicing mindfulness. This is such important information that you're sharing with us. Um, also being mindful of time. Uh, there are a few questions that are coming in um, and we will hold on to those questions. Sonia, Jadrian, Manisha, uh, who have posted the questions, but just also want to touch upon this second element or the second big shift you describe in the book is about structure. Mm -hmm. So how do most people come up with their rules in their relationship? And how would you recommend couples come up with their relationship structure. So, you know, I think just also dipping into, um, you know, what you have shared so far, there is some kind of an assumption of like how much give and take is happening, how much we're meeting. Uh, and it may be not so balanced in every relationship. Maybe it's like more tilted from one partner to the other. So can you talk us talk to us about like, if we are really struggling with putting a structure and the set of priorities and sharing some of that work and, and even sharing that sense of radical generosity, what could actually enable uh, people to do more, more of that? Yeah, well, I love that question. Yeah. And just to go back, if we look at really the basic question we're trying to answer here in this book, it's about how can we be equals and in love? Mm -hmm. How can we strive for equality without totally destroying connection and intimacy? And we think this is really the fundamental question that all modern couples face. And so as we've talked about, the easy answer to this question is to say, well, let's achieve equality by making everything fair, keeping score, and just sort of living out this idea of fairness. And as we've been describing, for all sorts of reasons, that's a disaster. <laughs> and it, it, it just simply doesn't work. So then the question becomes, is there a way to achieve a more meaningful sense of equality that doesn't involve this kind of scorekeeping and constantly looking at what your partner's doing? And we think that the way you can get there is through taking a more careful look at the structure of your life. And so we think of structure as like all of the logistics and organizational pieces that make up your life together. And that includes things like your roles, who does what, things like your priorities, your boundaries, how you arrange power, even sex we include in the book as an element of this structure. And so when it comes to structure, if we just look at one piece of that, roles, which is where a lot of inequality shows up and a lot of conflict shows up, when we interviewed most couples for this book, we would ask them, how did you decide who does what? And it was hilarious. We had no idea that this was going to happen. But every time we asked this question, almost, like, oh. yeah, they would. there would be this awkwardly long pause. They'd look at us and they'd say some version of, gosh, I, I don't know. We never really decided. There was one guy we interviewed who was like, I'm the toothbrush guy. <laughs> I have no idea how I became the toothbrush guy, but every night when our daughter goes to bed, I'm the guy brushing her teeth. And so we actually named this strategy because it was so universal. We called it the wing it approach to roles. And that was our approach in our marriage. When we got married, Kaylee was a fully functional adult. We were 26 years old. She was just leaving a job in consulting. I, on the other hand, was a graduate student living in a dorm that I cleaned like twice a year. At most. 
And so we just fell into this structure of roles where I was the under contributor, Kaylee was the over contributor. And that became, it had this kind of momentum that really created all sorts of problems in our life. And we turned to fairness as the solution, which as we've been talking about, didn't really work that well. And so I think you ask a really good question. If sort of the way that we fall into it might be imitation of our parents or assumption of some gender expectations or winging it, what's a different way that could lead us to more of a shared structure of success? And here's where we recommend start with a conversation about values because there's actually not a single definition of success that in our interviews in particular, it was really powerful to see how many different versions of success couples had. So some had really said, we value education. And so shared success for us is about educating our children at the best institutions. And others said, success for us is about financial stability. And others said, success for us is about living adventure. And that couple stands out for me. Uh, that's the Honey Trekkers, who I believe are on year eight, or nine, nine of like their honeymoon. And these are choices where you know they have sold all of their belongings, they live in a van, they travel the world, and they are delighted with their life. They don't have a 401k that we know about, and they've chosen at this point not to have children. But shared success for them was about adventure which wouldn't necessarily be our definition of success, but that's not what matters. So really the foundation here is have a conversation about what is this chapter of your life and your marriage about? And we think about them as chapters because hopefully there's a catalyst either now or when you're first in relationship with someone to have that initial conversation about shared values. But then it's important to revisit anytime there's a big transition. So that could be a new job, that could be if you move to a new city, that could be the birth of a child or the graduation of a child or becoming empty nesters, that in these moments of transition is when we find it's so meaningful to pause and reconvene and ensure that you're on the same page about what you're striving for and what success means for both of you so you can be aligned in that pursuit. And, and there are some tips that you provide in the book that yeah. tell you how to approach that conversation and, and have a structure. Yeah, Manisha is actually just chiming in here to say, you know, in some cultures, like, you know, women or like men or one of the partners are expected to take, put in like 100, more than 100%. And, you know, um, th that's like what I saw growing up, you know, in my culture mm -hmm. as well, right? Like my mom was a homemaker and my dad was the bread earner and this is like how it worked like everything was on her um to take care of so this is what this is great um just really uh looking at our time here i think we have a few few more minutes to keep going before we open it up for q a uh so what inspired you to write this book mm. you know <laughs> i think you've mentioned a few milestones in your own life where you started kind of feeling wow like this could go differently or in a better way yeah. when did you arrive at some ideas that you know now that you've implemented in your life and now you want to share it with the world so can you talk to yeah. us a little bit about that you bet. This, this book was definitely born out of our own experience and our own struggle. And I actually think the beginning of the story goes all the way back to high school. So you had a very good guess that we might have met in college, but we actually met in high school. So we were, um, our senior year of high school, we shared a chemistry lab table. We will spare you all of the chemistry jokes. And, uh, at that point in time, we really internalized the messages that we were getting from our parents about, you know, be the best that you can be, achieve your potential. That's what led us both to go to Stanford, for Nate to go to Princeton, you know, consulting and coaching that there was this, you know, attempt by both of us to really be our individual best selves. And for a little while, that seemed to work, that we could stay connected and in love and these sort of respites between our individual big dreams. And really, it was when our daughter was first born that that was just on an absolute collision course, that it felt like our whole structure was fraying at the seams. 
And we were ending up in lots and lots of arguments and frustrated and hurt conversations about whose turn it was and why it wasn't working, why it wasn't fair. And that's kind of what led us to initially the literature looking for, has anybody unpacked? We're living in a different time. We're living against a different backdrop. This context is complex in different ways. Not that it's more or less, but complex in different ways from that of our parents. And there really, there wasn't anything. And so that was really the catalyst for us to say, gosh, can we do the homework? Can we share the experiences to see if we can't design and discuss and offer a way that resonates with couples in this modern age? And so what was the most surprising uh, part of mm. writing this book? You know, where were you like, wow, I didn't know yeah. this. Yeah. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, there were a few things. One of the things that was really shocking and surprising and we never would have expected mm -hmm. is that we've been writing about leadership and mindfulness for well over a decade now. And at no point during that whole journey has anybody ever come up to me and said, you know, you should be so careful writing about mindfulness. I knew a guy who went on a meditation retreat and he just lost it. If you write about mindfulness, you're going to lose your mind. You're going to go crazy. And I know that sounds like a really strange thing to say, but the moment we started working on this project and we started telling people, yeah, we're thinking about writing a book on marriage, people were coming out of the woodwork, coworkers, friends, family, people we hardly even knew to say some version of, you guys, this is dangerous. I'm not sure you should touch this. There was one guy I remember, he called me up and he wanted to tell me that he had these friends who started a podcast on how to have a healthy, better marriage, and they got divorced a year later. <laughs> and so this belief that we kept hearing again and again was some version of, if you do this book, you will likely get divorced. And not only will you get divorced, the world will be laughing at you when you do. <laughs> and so this was just a really strange thing for us because the fear of all of these other people actually started to become contagious yeah. at a certain point where we thought, man, should we do this? Should we I, touch the third rail of self-development? Exactly. I mean, it just, it felt like an idea that somebody needed to explore and we had so much passion for it, but we were also hearing this. And so what's interesting about that is it actually changed the way we approach the book. So we started to think pretty early on as a result of all these people telling us, you know, you're going to get divorced, <laughs> that we really didn't want this to be a book about us. This wasn't going to be a book about our model of marriage or how we do marriage. We wanted this to be a book about modern marriage writ large. And that sort of framed our methodology for the book where we wanted to interview as many people as possible. We ended up interviewing a little bit over 100 people just to understand, you know, what are the common challenges? What are the patterns? What are the things that, that couples are finding are, are helpful solutions? And so it was surprising, but it ended up actually being a really powerful initial challenge that helped shape the way we wrote the book. Lovely. Yes, I think, you know, it's so important. What I'm hearing is to kind of use your life experiences and at the same time have the greater good in mind, right? Like what is yeah. it that we have learned in our relationship and from hearing the stories, the hundred couples that you've interviewed, what are yeah. some of the common themes and elements? And I'm sure like, you know, when I was flipping through the book, thank you for sending me a copy. Mm. Uh, I really found like so many things resonating with me. And then there were a few things where like, oh, I haven't quite experienced that yet in my life. So, mm. you know, I think there will be that um, element that it, that's involved in there. And looks like you made it. You, you both look, you're going even stronger after writing the book. So congratulations. <laughs> uh, and I, you know, wish you all the, all the well for that. Um, I will ask one final closing question and then we'll open it up for uh, questions coming in through the live stream. So if you are listening to us today, do feel free to go to YouTube link and then just enter your questions and one of our colleagues will uh, read them out. My final question to you both is, you know, what's the one insight or practice you hope uh, couples or individuals, you know, one of the partner listening to us today 
can take away from our talk uh, in this moment and just do like one step towards creating this radical generosity mindset or the 8080 mindset? What's an invitation or an insight you can provide to us? I love this question. I would go back to the practice that we did just a little while ago that hopefully there are lots of things to take, but if there is just one thing, it's to actually do that contribution that you wrote down and express the appreciation that you wrote down. That if that can be something that's taken out of an idea and put into practice, a radically generous contribution, an appreciation, I think that can really change the culture of marriage. And it's funny, Ruchika, we had this experience the other night where it gets contagious, contagious for good, that mm -hmm. there was a way that um, we'd had a really, really hard rehearsal. And yeah, this is basically the night before launch, we were going to be on TV the next morning. And uh, the rehearsal was hard. Um, <laughs> Nate was not good. Yeah, you can you can share the. the <laughs> and I bombed the the rehearsal. And so I wrote him a sticky note, just put it on his bedside table to remind him of what a beautiful presenter he is, how much I believe in him and this project, and just left it. And I woke up the next morning to just a thoughtful, caring, beautiful card. And the part of the story that's my favorite is that that evening, our nine-year-old left us good luck notes on our bedside table. So it seems small. I mean, it was us one sticky note. And yet I really believe that it has the power to transform our relationships and our families. Yeah, we like to talk about that as almost like an upward spiral versus the downward spiral of 50-50, where there's more resentment, more conflict. These radical acts of generosity lead to more radical acts of generosity. And it, it's this amazing phenomenon that can really change the culture of marriage. Lovely. Wow. I've experienced that in many other facets of life, not with sticky notes uh, going contagious yet, but I'm going to get definitely give that a try. But it shows it can be super low tech. You don't yes. need to do anything yes. crazy. <laughs> Actually, there is a really good big message there, right? Like, you know, keeping or sharing the notes and writing versus like text, there could be some difference in it, you know? I've often had like text come in from my loved ones even, and then some other notification comes up and then I get so distracted right away that I take mm -hmm. like even 10 minutes to respond to a beautiful note that I received. So, so that was just like a quick takeaway that I had when you mentioned that. Well, thank you so much, uh, Kaylee and Nate. This has been really powerful discussion and I look forward to reading your full book. I will turn it over to my colleague, Mel, who is gonna take the questions that has come up in the live chat. Um, and uh, yeah, great to see you both and hoping to stay connected with you on this path. Thank you so much. Look yeah. forward to longer and more connection. Thank you. Thank you. Great. So a question um, that has come up from Sonia is everyone may need different amount of space. How do you not feel guilty, unfair uh, for taking more than your partner? Mm -hmm. Can you talk to us about that? Yeah. What an interesting question, because in some ways, space can become just one more piece of the fairness battle. And so I think what's really powerful in your question, is it Sonia who's asking? Awesome. Yes. Yeah. Sonia is in, in relationship, very often there's one person who needs more of something or craves more of something or is better at something. So for instance, one person might want more space. Someone else might want the house to be cleaner. Someone else might want more social engagement. And really what we found is that Having that person for whom either the standards are higher or the needs are greater, have that person spearhead how the agreement or conversation works in the partnership really helps. The other piece of this that I think is really powerful is that there's a mindset question embedded in your question, which is, 
if I see my partner engaging in taking space or alone time, solitude, meditation, whatever it is that he or she might need, if I see that as a slight, then it's likely that I would measure against it. Whereas if I experience that as a gift to our relationship, it actually can feel really beneficial. Truly in our relationship, <laughs> I hope I'm allowed to oh, say yeah, this. Oh yeah, absolutely. Nate needs more space than I do. I, do. I am extroverted, he is introverted. His meditation practice is much more disciplined and longer than mine. And there was a period of time in our relationship where I will acknowledge I resented him for it. I was like, how come you get to go meditate and go do <laughs> yoga? That's not fair. And yet now I genuinely experience the spaciousness that he brings to our partnership, the pause that he can bring where there's such a lack of reactivity that space that serves both his introvert and his mindfulness practice is actually a gift to me. Yeah, it's such a great question. Thank you. Jadrian, I hope I'm saying your name right. Mm -hmm. uh, Jadrian is asking, you talked about individual cognitive biases, but what about gender biases? In heterosexual partnerships, women almost always end up contributing more. It doesn't sound like 8080 counteracts that. Yeah, this is a great question. Um, and this is something we were very sensitive to in writing this book. Um, we actually, before we get to 50-50 in the book, we talk about the 80-20 model, which is 1950s classic model. Woman contributes 80% or more, man contributes 20% or less. And, um, you know, one of the things we found to your point is that all of the research is very clear that women consistently over contribute, men consistently under contribute. It's not true of all relationships, but it is absolutely something that that's that's pervasive. And so throughout the book, we try to um, address that not through fairness, we think of fairness as a kind of very clunky technology for achieving equality and mitigating some of these gender inequalities. I mean, it, it works for some people, but for many couples, we found that this idea that we're going to counteract these structural inequalities in gender and, and contribution in marriage actually exacerbates them, mm -hmm. right? That, that it creates even more inequality. And we experienced that in our own life where I was the under-contributing partner. Kaylee was the over-contributing partner. And the more Kaylee tried to tell me that things weren't fair, the less I wanted to do, right? We reached a certain point in our relationship where I basically said, there's nothing I can do that's going to satisfy you or ever achieve fairness in your eyes. So I'm just not going to do anything, right? So so in other words, this, this approach of fairness turned out to sort of have the reverse effect of its intended effect. And so in the book, what we argue is that this idea of structure, so we talked about, you know, creating an intentional structure around roles, really thinking carefully about how we balance power and neutralize asymmetries of power. That's the way we think you can start to counteract those gender inequalities. And that's the way you can achieve a more meaningful experience of equality, where you know if we sit down together and we create a more balanced distribution of roles, or we figure out how to distribute power in a more balanced way, that's such a more powerful experience of equality than constantly nagging each other about like whether things are or not fair. So I love the question. I think it's such an important question. And it's definitely a question that we wanted to address in the context of the book. One thing that we actually snuck into is what we call the 80-90 nudge, which <laughs> yes. is that based exactly on what you're describing, that because of the historical legacy of the way that gender norms shaped roles and relationships, that if you're committed to 80-80 in your partnership and you're in a heterosexual couple and you're male, so lots of ifs, <laughs> then we encourage the nudge, strive for 90%, just because there's so much historical um, cognitive biasy uh, blind spot that you're actually working against. And I will say one other thing on that. 
the research about over or overestimation of our own contributions shows very interestingly that both women and men overestimate their contributions. So we both have this cognitive bias, but men do it way more. <laughs> right? So, so not only are men guilty in the abstract of doing less, but they're also guilty of overestimating their contributions, which just magnifies the problem. Good insights. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so Priya is asking, do you have any tips for long distance relationships? Mm -hmm. So in long distance relationships, in some ways, the, the basics are consistent. So the mindset of radical generosity, what we think is really powerful is that most of the time in long distance relationships, you're operating in sort of too muchness. So too much space, and then often lots and lots of togetherness where you need to fit everything in. We actually dated long distance for the first two years of our relationship, which was interesting. And so in 8080, I think one of the most important things is being intentional about your space and togetherness and then asking really good questions. So we love throughout 8080 and there are some really great apps out there, making sure that if you're together in the same space, and especially if you're long distance, you're asking about what's really going on. Great, thank you. All right, Audrey is asking, how do you stop your natural fairness meter mm -hmm. from constantly keeping score? Okay, it's Audrey. Over indexed mind. <laughs> yes, Audrey. By the way, we're going to steal the fairness meter. I love that I idea. I love that idea. We're going to start talking about fairness <laughs> meters. Um, it was funny. One of the couples we interviewed said some version of, "We become accountants when things aren't fair." You know, so mm -hmm. this idea of having a fairness meter is right on, mm -hmm. and it's a fairly universal phenomenon. It's something we've definitely experienced, and. What I love about this question is in some ways, it brings us back to mindfulness mm -hmm. because we wrote this book. We've been playing around, like living these ideas as deeply as we possibly can for years. And every single day I have the thought, this is not fair. Um, just, you know, I maybe it was this morning, maybe it was yesterday. I can't even remember. I was unloading the dishwasher or something like that. And I thought to myself, I've unloaded this dishwasher three times and she hasn't. And so in my mind, I have this whole narrative going around fairness. And so that's where mindfulness can be so powerful because the reality is just as in meditation, it's impossible to get rid of your thoughts yeah. and it's impossible to get rid of your emotions and your sensations. That's just like the game. That's part of what's happening. I think it's true also of these thoughts about fairness, this fairness meter that we have going, that it will always be there. If we be can become aware of it though, if we can notice that it's happening, then all of a sudden we have a choice and we can make a little bit of space and perhaps shift to a more productive mindset, which is something like radical generosity. So for us, when, when we're experiencing this and we talk about this a little bit in the book, first step is awareness. Second step is just some sort of mental cue. So in my mind, I'll just think to myself, radical generosity, or I'll think about all the things Kaylee did that were contributions to our life together. And then all of a sudden, I'll start to notice that that fairness meter falls away and I'm able to shift the way I'm doing whatever I'm doing, whether it's unloading the dishwasher, washing the dishes, I'm doing the same thing, but I'm shifting the mindset behind it, which radically transforms my experience. Mm -hmm. So instead of being stressed out and experiencing resentment and a cascade of stress hormones in my body, all of a sudden I'm able to just sort of relax into doing what I'm doing as a gift, which is pretty different. It's totally different. I would say that I do the exact same thing and I will sometimes cue myself that as soon as fairness comes across my mind, because like Nate, it comes up every day, I'll cue myself with either radical generosity or gratitude, which is just another word for appreciation. And I go looking for what is he doing right then that I appreciate? So as a, for instance, just the other night I had made dinner, I was cleaning up dinner and I was cleaning the counters and I looked around and I was like, 
how come they're playing cards, right? And my first thought was, that's not fair. And what was interesting is that, you know, after the interviews and the practices, I then asked myself, I was like, how am I grateful for this? And what's actually true is I didn't want to play another card game, like the same card game 20 times in a day that's past my threshold. <laughs> and so in that moment, I was so grateful that Nate was willing to do that. And I actually got like a moment of free time in the kitchen, just me and the sponge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, love it. I think just to kind of counter this sense of like uh, animosity or like competitive feelings that can come in, like I have been doing all of this work and then just replacing that intentionally, mindfully with expanding our awareness into like what else has been happening and where the contributions are taking place. So thank you. Thank you for sharing. Let's, we have two more questions and awesome. Yeah. All right. So Tara is asking, do you feel 8080 works any differently with dating where couples are starting to set up the way they want their relationship to work, plus worry about scaring one another off, good timing, et cetera? Oh, I can totally relate, Tara. So thank you for asking that question. <laughs> yes. I think that's a great question. We actually have this example from our interviews that was pre-marriage. It was from a, a early dating situation where there was this gentleman who was, I think he had just moved in with his girlfriend. So it was kind of the early stages of dating. And he came home and he expected his girlfriend to be there, but she wasn't. He expected that she was gonna maybe make him dinner, but she didn't. And he described to us that he was sitting there just full of resentment and mad and thinking about, you know, why isn't she here? Why are we having more fun? Why are we having better sex, right? All these thoughts were flooding his mind. And then what he described to us is he had, he said, a kind of voice of God moment where in his mind he thought, well, what have I done for her? And so he asked himself that question and he started to think, well, I guess not that much. I'm expecting everything from her without actually giving much in return. So he went out to this Korean deli and he bought her all of her favorite things. And lo and behold, she walked through the door as he was checking out at this Korean deli. She noticed that he had bought all her favorite foods and just totally melted and their relationship was transformed. And so to me, that story says, you can experience this shift of radical generosity, the shift to compassion or to, con to connection really anytime. It doesn't have to be 10 years into a marriage or 20 years into a marriage. Now, some of the structural stuff around like shared values, how you're dealing with power and money and roles, that you probably want to save. You probably don't want to <laughs> get into that day one. But if you can do that as those questions are starting to come up, so you know, the moment you start to live together, I think it can create a really positive momentum that's pretty different than what we experienced yeah. through the winged approach. Yeah. I, I love that you're even asking the question, like, lucky your significant other, <laughs> that you're thinking about these questions with this perspective of how do I bring them up in a way that invites them into the conversation? Because that's what I really hear you doing. Sweet. Thank you. Uh, so we have a question from Bill. Let's see. Um, Bill is asking, how do you deal with one partner not holding up their end of the 80-80? that is lapsing into not being radically generous? Yeah, this is a great question. So ideally, 80-80 is a shared thing, right? You get both of the 80s participating. Bill, what I hear you asking, that's a really important question, is what happens when it's really one-sided? And there's two different answers to this single question. One is that it's actually transformative just for yourself to live from this mindset of radical generosity. That even if my partner never does anything different in his or her own entire life, my experience of the relationship, I am very likely doing all of the same things that I was doing before. It just feels different. The second answer is this could be a really great opportunity for a reveal and request to be able to say, Hey, gosh, I noticed it was my third time unloading the dishwasher. And I'd love if you'd take a turn. 
Underneath it, though, I think there's a really powerful question, which is if I'm the over contributing partner. So if I'm the one and I feel like I'm really doing my 80, but gosh, my slacker partner over there, they're only doing 20 or 30, like they're not even up at 50. Then I think there's a question around how have I, as the over contributing partner, possibly unconsciously, very likely unconsciously, set up our relationship so that I'm the one who's kind of always doing more. And it's a painful question to look at. This was one that I faced really strongly, was that I would sort of look and be like, how come I'm doing everything? But underneath that, I recognized initially that was because I wanted the control. I wanted to know how everything was being done, that it was being done right according to my standards, right in huge quotations. And so really only when I was willing to be helped, when I was willing to let go of some of my control around things, could I allow Nate to show up and really be that 80-80 partner with me? That's very interesting that you mentioned the the concept of control. Like I have actually experienced that as a mother as well. Like, you know, when my children are trying to do something and I want it happen in a certain way. Uh, so that brought uh, that memory. There are a lot of thank yous coming up, uh, you know, in the chat. So thank you, Nate um, mm -hmm. and Kaylee. Uh, Lily has like one clarifying question and then we'll close after this. Lily is saying, did you recommend to drop the concept of the fairness instead of giving love? As one party can always think unfair if they feel, con if they feel contributed more, if they feel they contributed more. Yeah, so I think, Lily, if I understand your question, we would say that trying to make things fair is a losing pursuit because you can never get there. So yes, drop fairness and instead pursue radical generosity because that leads you to be equals and in love. Sweet. Such a sweet note to end at. Thank you so much. Lots of hearts and love and thank yous <laughs> coming through the chat. Uh, Kelly and Nate, it has been a true pleasure to host you both today. Thank you for giving us some really good tips in these times of need when we have the moment to practice them. So uh, with that, thank you everyone for joining today and uh, the recording will also be available later on. Thank you team for helping us put this show together. Yeah, and thank you so much for having us. Yes, what an honor. Absolutely.